Major funding for innovation was provided by the Johnson & Johnson family of companies, supplying health care products worldwide. By Canon, quality and innovation for the way we work and live. For a transcript, send $3 to Innovation, WNET 13, Newark, New Jersey, 07102. Please specify episode subject and title. Make checks payable to the Educational Broadcasting Corporation. The McNeil Air News Hour tomorrow at 7. Tonight on 13. At 9, the father of psychoanalysis. Are his theories still valid today? Freud under analysis. Then at 10. There have been some kids in my school who get great grades when they do cocaine. Frontline goes inside America's schools for a report on the battle to stop drugs. And I just love the feeling. You know, I love the way it makes me feel. The only thing I don't like about it is what it's caused. Stopping Drugs, Part 2. That's tonight on 13. In baseball, it was Jackie Robinson. In boxing, it was Archie Moore and Floyd Patterson and Muhammad Ali. In tennis, Althea Gibson. In basketball, William Popgates and Oscar Robertson. In track and field, Alice Coachman and Wilma Rudolph. In football, Jim Brown. Each athlete a pioneer in the integration of American sports. The story of new times, next time on Black Champions. Tomorrow at 10. Terrorism isn't just people with a swarthy complexion that speak Arabic. Terrorism can be pink cheeks and speak with a Shamrockian brogue. We are very used to seeing today's terrorist become tomorrow's father of his people. Watch the last in our series, Allies and Extradition. This March, we look to the stars with a galaxy of entertainment. Superstars from every world of music, from Broadway to folk, from opera to rock, from pop to polka, and a one and a two and a star-studded lineup of Hollywood's finest movies. And the stories behind the stars, tributes to the greats by the greats with a personal look at what made them great. And here's Johnny along with other TV favorites. And the stars of the animal world, from the cute and cuddly to the wild and untamed. There's low comedy, high drama, and a spectacular supernova. Whether you look upstairs or downstairs, it's elementary, my dear Watson, that everywhere you look, you'll see stars when we look to the stars, March 7th through the 22nd. 16 days of jam-packed excitement on 13 when the experiment continues. Tonight on NOVA, Sigmund Freud revolutionized our thinking about the human mind. But who was this man? And how do his theories hold up today? Freud really believed that he had come upon certain insights about the way the mind works that he regarded as remarkable and quite original. Mind you, he did have insight, but if you ask in strict scientific terms, I'd be very surprised if much of it survived. Tonight on NOVA, Freud Under Analysis. Major funding for NOVA is provided by this station and other public television stations nationwide. Additional funding was provided by the Johnson & Johnson family of companies, supplying health care products worldwide. And by Allied Signal, a technology leader in aerospace, electronics, automotive products, and engineered materials. Sigmund Freud is heralded as one of the great thinkers of the 20th century, famous for his ideas on dreams, childhood sexuality, and the role of the unconscious. Freud saw himself as a scientist who had discovered a method of understanding the mysteries of the mind, which he called psychoanalysis. But how scientific is psychoanalysis? And how well do Freud's ideas stand up to our modern understanding of the mind? 
Freud revolutionized the way we think about ourselves. But today there is a widening gap between the popular and the scientific views of Freud. We live clearly in a Freudian world and it is quite unthinkable to envision the world without his language, without his ideas, however well or ill they are expressed. And there's no doubt that his, his ideas appeal to the imagination of the time, partly because they are revolutionary and partly because they seem to fit into the general way of thinking. And so they had a very large cultural impact, and yet the probability is that they won't be correct. The Freudian revolution began here in Vienna. These films, taken in the late 1920s, show Freud's followers. They came from all over the world to the city that was known as the center of psychoanalysis. Some were physicians like Freud, others were intellectuals drawn to Vienna by the excitement of being part of a new movement. But most came to learn Freud's radical new form of treatment. They entered his famous consulting rooms at Berggasse 19 in the hopes of undergoing a training analysis with the master himself. When these films were taken, Freud was in his 70s. His daughter, Anna, herself an analyst, was a constant companion. Psychoanalysis was Freud's passion. During the day, he saw patients. At night, he spent hours reading or writing. He was tireless in his devotion to what he called his new science. His ideas were so powerful, so potent, that they have dramatically influenced almost every discipline, including literature, art, and medicine. But the Freudian legacy is a complicated one. Although he wanted psychoanalysis to stand on its own as a science, it is known today mainly as a form of therapy. As a young doctor in the 1930s, Joseph Wirtis traveled to Vienna to undergo a training analysis with Freud. Now a psychiatrist at the State University of New York, Dr. Wirtis describes his first session. I was rather surprised at his uh, physical appearance. Uh, he was then uh, well uh, into his uh, 70s, and he was, uh, looked extremely small and, uh, and frail, and at the same time, uh, quite energetic. He spoke in a vigorous uh, sort of uh, professorial uh, style, uh, clipping his, uh, his uh, syllables, and uh, he uh, uh, was direct and to the point. Uh, he said he would be glad to take me on. He stated his fee which would be uh, uh, the equivalent of $20 an hour, which uh, seems very little nowadays, but in those days in Vienna, it was a substantial fee. And uh, he said, uh, my uh, responsibilities uh, would be uh, simply to uh, expose uh, my thoughts, uh, my uh, feelings, uh, to be uh, candid, uh, to uh, discuss my uh, dreams. And uh, he did not uh, set a specific goal, I think his assumption was that in time, uh, material would turn up which uh, he would interpret or, as he would say, bring to consciousness. And uh, that's how the uh, analytic uh, uh, process would uh, unfold. Uh, I would come in and say, uh, Herr Professor, I had some really uh, good uh, dreams last night. And he would say, fine, uh, let's uh, talk about them. And uh, he would uh, you know, uh, approach them uh, with a real interest and, and zest. And if I was able to pitch in uh, with some uh, interpretations that he liked, uh, he would say this was, this was a very good session. On the other hand, if I uh, was skeptical and uh, resistant, uh, he would uh, show his, uh, his disappointment and sometimes his irritation uh, in no uh, uncertain uh, way. And uh, he would say, you have no right to be skeptical. He said, first, you should learn about the analysis. When the Freud Museum opened in London in the summer of 1986, many of Freud's followers, those who did learn about the analysis, gathered to pay tribute. Among them was an historian from Yale University, Professor Peter Gay, the author of a new biography of Freud. The museum is in the house where Freud lived the last year of his life after having fled Vienna during the Nazi occupation. He brought with him many of his prized possessions his writing desk, his collection of antiquities, and the famous couch. Professor Peter Gay. 
case you look around his study and uh, above all in his consulting room, you can see he had really two passions and they blend into one. One was psychology. He said, I have a tyrant, psychology, and he welcomed that tyrant. And the other was, of course, collecting antiquities, which um, he collected avidly as soon as he could afford, afford them, which was from the uh, late 1880s on. Freud said, these are characteristic of what I do. I, too, am an archaeologist. I like to dig, and what I dig at, uh, of course, and dig into is the human mind. And that metaphor of uh, digging uh, as an ar archaeologist, whether it is finding those treasures or digging in, uh, to ancient Rome, as he says in one of his uh, books, does bring this together. And his own sense was that this collecting took him back to a kind of childhood of humanity, as he uh, once said. And this is, of course, very close to the work that he was doing when he sat in his chair analyzing patients, going back to their childhood as well. Vienna at the turn of the century was a city of contradictions. It was dominated by the Victorian ethic of strict morality. At the same time, it was also a city excited by new ideas coming from a vibrant artistic and intellectual community. But Freud's Vienna was a world of science and medicine. His friends were doctors. His education, his medical education, was crucial for him, uh, much more important, I think, than uh, it might be for any ordinary physician, because he absorbed with it not merely medical knowledge, of, of which he had a great deal and which he used in a kind of, uh, as a psychologist rather than uh, as a doctor, but also a philosophy, a view of the world, a completely secular, materialistic view into which he uh, fitted his psychology. Freud distinguished himself academically at a very young age. He was a prolific writer and an avid reader in the arts, humanities, and sciences. He attended the University of Vienna to study medicine, one of the few professions with opportunities for a young Jewish man. Freud was schooled in the scientific methods of the 19th century laboratory, which stressed the importance of experimentation, observation, and measurement. He became an expert in neurology. These drawings illustrate his interest in the brain and nervous system. His experiments with nerve cells led him to invent a new method of dyeing tissue samples for study. Freud also experimented with cocaine. He used it himself for at least 10 years. He was enthusiastic about its therapeutic properties and speculated on its potential as an anesthetic for the eye, publishing several papers, including On Cocaine. During these years, he was greatly influenced by his university professors, especially Ernst von Brücke, an adherent of the Helmholtz School of Thought, scientists who believed that everything was reducible to chemical and physical forces. In the scientific mind of the 19th century, all phenomena could be logically understood. But Freud, now 30 years old and engaged to be married, was warned by his teachers that he would never make enough money as a researcher. They encouraged him to work with patients and open a private practice. For several years, Freud worked in psychiatric hospitals and clinics. As his practice grew, he became interested in hysteria, a nervous disorder in which patients experience physical symptoms but have no underlying physical disease. He began using a new, controversial technique, hypnosis. Discouraged with the results, however, he turned to his colleague and close friend, Josef Breuer, for advice. As Freud later described, it was from these conversations that psychoanalysis began to take form. For some time, when he was asked who was the founder of psychoanalysis, he would not say, I am the founder, but rather he would use his friend and collaborator, a uh, somewhat older Viennese physician, uh, uh, Josef Breuer, because Breuer had told him the story of one of his, of Breuer's patients. The stories of uh, a young, intelligent, uh, well-educated woman who develops all kinds of bizarre psychological symptoms. She forgets her German, for example. She uh, finds herself unable to drink water out of a glass. Uh, she has long lapses of attention, uh, which uh, appear to be hysterical in some sense. And of course, that is how later it will be called, a, a very complicated case of hysteria. Now, Breuer, more or less by accident, comes upon uh, the way of dealing with and disposing of these symptoms. He does so by asking her 
or she in a way suggests this to him, um, and her share in the cure is very important, that that should all be talked out. So that whenever a symptom is mentioned, that she should see if she could remember what this reminded her of. This becomes then the famous talking cure. At first, Freud talked to his patients while they were in a hypnotic state. He believed hysterical symptoms were related to painful events from childhood. He thought that if his patients could remember and talk about the first time they experienced their symptoms, 